I want to talk to you about how to make politics in our democracies less divisive and more productive. I've got an amazing job. My job is to teach young men and women from countries all around the world to think seriously about what kind of world they want to make and leave behind to those who come after them. And I've learned something really important. No matter where people come from, most of us basically want the same things. We want a world with justice, not a world with injustice. We want a world in which people do what's right, not in which people do what's wrong. We want a world with good, not a world with evil. Only in comic books and action movies do you find the kinds of villains bent on doing evil for evil's sake. In the real world, there are very few people like that. In the real world, there's an important sense in which all of us really do want the same thing. But there's a problem, and it's this problem that I want to talk to you about today. When we ask ourselves what it is for a society or for a world to be just, we give totally different answers, incompatible answers. We disagree about justice. We disagree about the role of religion in politics. We disagree about taxes and the welfare state. We disagree about immigration and surveillance and the environment. We disagree about abortion and assisted suicide and prostitution and pornography and war and peace. These disagreements concern big moral choices that we can't just decide to ignore. Moral choices are different from other kinds of choices. If I'm not sure what caused the Peloponnesian War or how old the universe is, I can just suspend judgment. But moral choices aren't like that. To use an old philosophical distinction, moral choices aren't theoretical. They're practical. They're not just about what to believe. They're about what to do. Suppose a friend of mine commits a terrible crime, and I'm deciding whether I ought to turn him into the authorities or say nothing. What should I decide to do? It doesn't make sense to say, well, I'm not sure. I'll suspend judgment. I won't do anything, since doing nothing just is one of the two options between which I'm choosing. Politics is like this. It's a participant sport, whether you like it or not. And so our disagreements about politics aren't ones that we can just set to the side. I often ask my students why they think there's so much disagreement about big moral questions. And usually in the first semester of the first week of term, they say the same thing. They say, Jeff, the reason there's so much disagreement about the moral truth is because there's no moral truth to be had. You're looking for nothing. Morality, they say, is like ice cream. I like mint chocolate chip, and you like strawberry and there's nothing really more to be said. This view has a pretty distinguished pedigree in the history of philosophy, but it's not one that most of us take seriously in practice. We don't think that those who say it's OK to murder, it's OK to enslave others, it's OK to orchestrate genocide, just have a different set of preferences than we do. We think they've gotten the truth about justice wrong. We think they've made a serious mistake in their reasoning. How else might we explain disagreement about justice? As an American, one of the days where I get the most homesick is the 4th of July. And when I remember to do so, I always like to, to reread the Declaration of Independence, one of these great documents that all Americans read year after year in school. And I always come across the most stirring and inspiring pronouncement of that document that everyone knows about. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And I can't even finish this sentence, because my mind stumbles over this phrase, self-evident. And I wonder, what did Thomas Jefferson mean by that? And I think what he meant was something like this. I think what he meant is that once you've grasped the idea that every human life is of amazing worth, and that all human lives have equal worth, and that the right way to respect that worth is to give people freedom to make of their lives what they will, once you recognize that ideal, it gets a grip on you. It becomes a kind of bedrock foundation to your thinking about what you owe to others. And I think that's right. But I also think it's important to realize that most people throughout history have never found the ideals of freedom and equality to be obvious. Most people have never professed to believe in those ideals, and even those who have, have often misunderstood them. I find Jefferson's political philosophy to be inspiring, but we must never forget that Jefferson owned slaves. It's perfectly possible to misunderstand the demands of one's own convictions. I think, the dis I think the explanation, the explanation of why there's so much disagreement about justice, is that justice is hard. 
Its demands are not obvious, and it takes enormous work figuring out what those demands are. Disagreement is therefore inevitable. inevitable. And I see democracy as a set of practices that, helps us, that help us grapple with that disagreement, that help us identify what our challenges are, figure out what the different candidate positions we can take might be, argue about them, and then in the midst of our disagreement, find some provisional solution to be enacted into law that stands in the name of all, even those who didn't vote for it. But for this process to work, it's not enough for people just to show up at the polls every few years. Democracy is so much more than voting. Democracy, I think, is an orientation. It's a way of seeing and relating to our fellow citizens. In particular, what I'd like to suggest is that democracy is about taking our fellow citizens seriously by taking their convictions seriously. And unless we do a better job of doing this, our politics isn't going to be as healthy or as productive or as intelligent as it could be in all democratic societies. So what's actually involved in taking each other seriously? I think there are three big things. The first thing involved in taking our fellow citizens seriously is recognizing that so many of the disagreements we have with them are not the products of obvious malice or lunacy or ignorance. The great debates of politics divide us precisely because the questions are so difficult. People of good faith with comparable intelligence, reasoning as hard as they can, nevertheless come to different answers to the same question. Disagreements about politics, in many cases anyway, are reasonable disagreements. They're really good arguments on both sides. Every year when I teach free speech, I talk about a famous Supreme Court case from the year 1977 in the United States. And in that case, a group of neo-Nazis wanted to take a march through a largely Jewish community called Skokie, Illinois. One out of six residents of Skokie, Illinois at the time was either a survivor of the Holocaust or closely related to a survivor of the Holocaust. And the question the Supreme Court needed to answer was, do the ideals of free assembly and free speech require that the Nazis be permitted to march? On the one hand, we're inclined to think that a free society is one in which government places as few restrictions as possible on the content of what its citizens may say. On the other hand, how could the Nazis invoke the ideal of freedom to justify the expression of a doctrine hostile to that very ideal? Why should Holocaust survivors have to be put up with such hatred, such an assault on their equal standing. Many democracies around the world restrict hateful speech on the grounds that it hijacks and poisons rather than enables and nourishes a culture of free expression among equals. And while that position may be mistaken, as the US Supreme Court ultimately decided it to be, it's not obviously mistaken. There are good arguments on both sides of this issue. I think a lot of our debates about politics are kind of like the debate about whether free speech protects hate speech or not. There are good arguments on both sides. But once we realize that there are good arguments on both sides of so many of the debates about which we get the most passionate in politics, it makes no sense to describe those debates and live out those debates, as we so often do, as if they were grand crusades between good and evil, rather than what they really are, reasonable disagreements. It makes no sense to demonize our fellow citizens with whom we disagree. Many people in Europe followed the news in the US while well, people were debating healthcare reform there. And imagine how the debate over healthcare would have gone if more citizens had done a better job of taking stock at just how difficult the questions involved were. Instead, conservatives excoriated liberals as traitors to the Constitution and liberals responded in kind by calling conservatives heartless monsters. This wasn't a productive national conversation. Now, recognizing that a disagreement is reasonable doesn't mean you need to change your mind about your position on it. All of us, at the end of the day, has a responsibility to make a call about what the right position on each issue is and then vote accordingly. But we don't need to make that call, as I think we so often do in so many democracies, from a posture of arrogance and certitude. Taking our fellow citizens seriously means recognizing that they have thought about these questions as hard as we have, but simply come to different answers. Now there's a second implication of what's involved in taking our fellow citizens seriously, and it applies regardless of whether the debates we have with them are reasonable or not. 
I was teaching a class recently about whether justice requires redistributing income from rich to poor, or whether justice, as many people think, forbids redistributing income from rich to poor. And I was heartened to see that two of my students continued the conversation out into the hallway after class, and one of them, whom I later learned was from a relatively disadvantaged family, was expressing enthusiasm for the idea that justice requires an expansion of the welfare state. And his fellow student didn't engage with his argument about this. He just looked at him and said, oh, please, the only reason you think that is because your family would stand to benefit from it. I think we hear arguments like this all the time in democratic politics. Now, notice what the second student wasn't doing was accusing the first student of being insincere. He accepted that the first student believed what he said he believed. Rather, he was accusing him of what psychologists call motivated reasoning. He was accusing him of being biased, in this case by his interests, into accepting certain kinds of beliefs. Motivated reasoning is just one species of a much bigger genus of moves that we regularly see in democratic debate, whereby people respond to convictions with which they disagree by trying to explain those convictions away. So think of people who oppose increased immigration on the grounds that they think it burdens native workers economically, who are simply laughed off as subconsciously moved by racist fears. Think of stay-at-home mothers who insist that their decision to stay at home is free and informed and consistent with the ideal of women's equality, who are told that they're victims of false consciousness, suffering from a mistaken view about what their interests are. Think about truck drivers who support conservative politicians and are then told that they've just been brainwashed into doing that by the talk radio pundits to whom they listen. All of these familiar accusations come from both left and they come from the right, but they have something in common. What they have in common is the perspective they take on the persons they describe. To see what I mean, think of a really simple question. Why does a person believe what she believes? That question's ambiguous. You might mean one of two things. You might mean what caused her to acquire those beliefs as opposed to other beliefs. But you might also think, why does she believe that her beliefs are true? These are different questions. Take a radical example, the development of Nazi ideology in Germany. You might tell a causal story about how people acquired Nazi beliefs, a story about how World War I defeat, coupled with international humiliation, coupled with economic depression, coupled with latent anti-Semitism, Hitler's charisma, all conspired to create a context in which people acquired all sorts of crazy beliefs. But if you would ask the Nazis, why do you believe what you believe, they wouldn't have listed out all the factors I just mentioned. They would have given you arguments, probably pretty bad arguments, no doubt bad arguments, but arguments nevertheless. These are two different perspectives we can take on human beings. Let's call the first the explanatory perspective. This perspective sees people not as masters of their own fate, but as cogs of history and genetics, pawns in a bigger historical narrative that they cannot control. But the second perspective, we can call it the argumentative perspective, sees people as what philosophers call moral agents, people who are authors of their own thoughts, who have the capacity to reflect on what is right and true. When someone disagrees with us in politics and we respond by saying, oh, you've just been duped or biased into believing that, we take up the explanatory perspective toward them. But when someone disagrees with us in politics and we ask them what their argument is, and we ask them to explain why they think they're right, and we tell them why we think they're wrong, and then we listen to what their response is, and we debate the issue, we take up the argumentative perspective. My suggestion is that the explanatory perspective, if you listen to the radio, if you watch TV interviews, occupies too large a role in our democratic politics. We need to switch the default to the argumentative perspective. We need to switch our default to a perspective in which we take people seriously as moral agents by taking their convictions seriously. That's not because the explanatory perspective is useless. Of course it's not. It's very important for scholars and citizens to understand how people acquire their beliefs and what our susceptibilities are to different kinds of cognitive bias. My point instead is that the argumentative perspective expresses respect for the people that we're engaging in debate with. Moreover, it's more productive. Suppose we're having a disagreement about, say, the death penalty, and I suggest that the only reason you support the death penalty is because you knew someone who was the victim of a serious crime, which has biased your thinking. But you might well respond that your personal experience has given you special insight into the problem that I accordingly lack. The explanatory perspective settles nothing. Only by shifting register into the argumentative perspective can anyone be convinced of anything.
there's one final implication of my thought that we ought to take our fellow citizens and their convictions a lot more seriously than we often do. Now, a lot of the disagreements I've been thinking of today are disagreements that divide many democratic societies. They're disagreements that people in this room probably have with one another. And a lot of the disagreements that we have in our democracies are disagreements about the best interpretation of a shared ideal, like individual liberty or moral equality. But there are, of course, people in the world that don't believe in individual liberty and moral equality. There are people both within our democracies and outside of them who think it's perfectly compatible with justice to organize societies along explicitly racist or sexist lines. There are people who think it is not only permitted by justice, but required by justice to impose a totalitarian religious vision on those who disagree with it. And it's tempting for demo defenders of democratic values to think that we shouldn't take such persons seriously, for we cannot possibly see our disagreements with them as reasonable at all. I think that's mistaken. I think even people whom we judge have been led astray deserve to be treated first and foremost as moral agents. I believe that whether or not we support the values of liberty and equality, whether or not we're inclined to view ourselves and others as beings of equal worth who ought to be respected is largely a matter of luck of whether you've been born into the kind of society who educates you into holding such a view or not. And just as we would not want others to give up on us had we been unlucky enough to have been born into societies that taught us false views about justice, we shouldn't give up on them. And even though we may and ought to disagree with them, we shouldn't do it from a posture of arrogance. We should remember the slogan, there but for the grace of God go I. Democracy at its best, isn't a war between permanent enemies. It's a project that we undertake together as equals to figure out what kind of world we want to make and leave behind for those who come after us. It's a journey among fellow travelers who at root want the same thing. We all want justice, even if we disagree about what it might mean. Thanks. <laughs>